intitulé « Dialogue stratégique sur la recherche en politique climatique au Canada uh, ». Hello to everyone, welcome to day two of the forum entitled « Strategic Dialogue on Climate Change Policy Research in, in Canada ». Uh, my name is Alain Bourque. I'm the head of the Uranus Consortium. I'll describe a bit more the consortium in a few slides. I'm a co-organizer of the event uh, with, uh, with, with uh, some of the partners that are indicated here uh, on the slide. So I'll actually begin by thanking the partners for this event and the uh, co-organizer also. So the Ivy Foundation for the, the, the financial support for the uh, event. Uh, also, the Institut des Nouveaux Mondes uh, for the technological aspects of, of the event. So, uh, especially in this context, you know, organizing this type of event was quite a bit different than what we expected about a year ago. Um, also, uh, thanks to the, to the Trottier Family Foundation and the Institut de l'Energie Trottier, who are co-organizer of the event, with also the Institut Canadien pour les choix climatiques, so the Canadian Institute for the Climate Choices, uh, for which we all are organizing this event for to support the activities of the, uh, of the Institute. So I'll, uh, I'll do a bit like what uh, Normand has done yesterday in the animation of day, uh, of day one. So for day two, I'll you know, begin with some basic instructions on how the, the, the afternoon is going to go. Um, so, with respect to language, there's no simultaneous translation, but you are invited to intervene in the language of your choice. Um, with respect to the ground rules, uh, of course, we will, uh, you know, try to follow the, the uh, agenda as tightly as possible, uh, because it is a tight agenda and we want to optimize time as much as possible. I think most of us now are not are now familiar with the meet, meeting etiquette, so how to use those technological tools. So don't forget to raise your hand when you want to uh, bring a point or make a comment. Mute your microphone otherwise, and especially don't forget to unmute it when you actually want to talk. Uh, try to be as brief as possible in your intervention in order to allow as many people as possible to uh, intervene. Don't hesitate to use the chat box for questions or even comments. We will copy everything that has been said in the chat box and we'll analyze it. And I mean, one of, I guess one of the things we've learned over the last few months is actually some of the added value of having in parallel a visual and oral uh, discussions uh, with those technology, uh, te technological tools, but at the same time also having the chat box, sometimes having parallel discussion in the chat box and in the, in video, so that I think that's uh, that's actually pretty good and, and and provide lots of information. Of course, before your intervention, we invite you to um, to make the acknowledgement of the uh, Aboriginal territory you're on. And again, during throughout the event, we've been making a, a bit of publicity for the website nativeland.ca, which is a very useful tool wherever you are in the country to actually recognize, for example, in my case, that I'm sitting on the land of the St. Lawrence, Iroquois, and, and the Mohawk uh, territory, unclaimed territory. Um, so I invite you again to go and see the, the website and don't hesitate to mention this uh, uh, throughout the event, throughout the afternoon. Um, very briefly, I said I would talk about uh, Uranos, a, a bit like Norma did about the Institute uh, yesterday, yesterday. So briefly, Uranos, objective is to try to advance science and adaptation in parallel at regional scales. So we're a boundary organization supported by, by our members. All of the logos of the members are here. I won't detail them, but you know, there's uh, quite a few ministries of the Quebec government, Hydro Quebec, Environment Canada, some universities, and, and we go outside of Quebec also working with Manitoba, Hydro Ontario Power Generation, Rio Tinto, uh, and municipalities in, increasingly. And they provide us kind of a basic support to have a critical mass of expertise on science and on adaptation on the front of climate change. And also we try to be, be, play a, a big role in connecting research and users to advance adaptation issues. So uh, the critical mass is now pretty big, 55 employees plus contributed employees from all of those organizations that are focused on adaptation to climate change and connecting science into uh, their issues. We have a budget of about 7 to 10 million per year. 
we generate leverage. We have a broad network of people that are significantly working on, on our scientific technical program. And as I said, we, we develop, implement, and realize and, and operationalize all kinds of user-driven interdisciplinary research projects. And here you have a, one of our pictures of our latest strategic plan is you know, the challenge of working in an integrated way with all aspects of science, all of disciplines of science that, have, that are relevant for climate change uh, adaptation. Uh, and I have a few images here that illustrate some of the projects we do. So, uh, on the upper left, you see uh, the, the window of regional climate modeling that we are developing with the university communities to do high resolution climate modeling. We are working with many partners, including the Prairie Climate Center and, uh, and PKIC in, in uh, British Columbia uh, with Environment Canada on the climate data website that you have probably heard about over the last few years. Uh, we here also illustrated down uh, a little bit further down left, uh, urban e Thailand map that was actually produced a long time ago, but, but is quite used in order to try to green the city of Montreal. And the final picture is illustrated, a big project we have doing cost benefit analysis of sea level rise and, and increased storminess and to rethink our coasts. So this is actually a visual, visual simulation of the outcome of the cost benefit analysis. But if you go in per se today, you actually see this underground. It was applied, it was implemented, and now you have a coastal zone that is much less at risk of sea level rise and, and storminess, and on the same occasion being actually quite nice <laughs> to, uh, to visit. And the last pitch for, uh, I guess, Uranus is just to tell everyone that we have our eighth symposium uh, in a couple of weeks from now. So it's spread it over two weeks. There's, all, there's 24 sessions. It's, it's in French, obviously, because we want to connect with our users here, but you're invited to consult the website and to, and to see it if you're interested about what's happening, you know, mostly in Quebec, in the front of science and adaptation. Coming back to the objective of the, of the workshop, I won't, you know, uh, tell them in details because you've seen it before in emails or in previous presentation, but obviously the objective is really to try to work together and discuss to identify research gap and research priorities for CICC, but also for ourselves, you know, as part of a community of people that are interested to advance climate change in Canada. So, so it, it is really a kind of a collective effort of trying to identify research gaps and research priorities. So we have developed a, an agenda to try to do this as much as possible. Um, in the context of the COVID, obviously. So instead of having the usual two-day full event uh, with, with even a, a, a sub, an evening supper, etc., then we try to use technology. So there was a thematic discussion session between uh, September 14th and September 25th, uh, organized around teams. So there was thematic discussion. Those teams were coming out of the analysis of a poll, of a survey that was done uh, earlier late spring of 2020 and so that's why we came up with those themes and there was a lot of discussions within those themes and priority que priority research questions that have emerged from that and we'll continue the discussion today. It's going to be the main objective of the discussion today. Uh, there was actually a fourth team around the tools and the, the, the research needs etc uh, uh, but, but it was only offline and then yesterday we had the day one with the natural resources and climate change, considering natural resource kind of a, a cross-cutting issues that is very important for a country like Canada, which has an economy uh, somewhat dependent on natural resources. And today is kind of the wrap-up day to try to identify, as I was saying before, the research gap, etc. Yesterday we had Corinne Le Quiry that made a very nice presentation on what's happening with respect to climate governance in, uh, in the UK and in France. And today we'll have Anne Hamil, who will also present her perspective on integrating uh, uh, climate, looking at climate change in an integrated way uh, in, with the focus on, on resilience a bit more uh, this time around. Uh, so, um, so I will not go much further uh, except to start the day with the, with the agenda. So you've all received the agenda, uh, I think. So we'll start.
uh, right, right after my words, uh, with the synthesis of the thematic discussion. So the three themes were cohabitation and governance, a need for new policy approaches, social and equity dimensions of low carbon transition and adapting to a changing uh, climate, and theme three, integrated strategy, uh, realizing transformation through the successful implementation of climate policy and looking at different uh, aspects in there. And then we'll go with the guest, guest speaker. So Anne Amil uh, at IISD will make her presentation on the challenge of developing an integrated approach to climate change uh, issue. There's gonna be opportunity for question and exchanges. Uh, we'll take a, qu a quick break just before starting at 2, 30 so that everyone can go to the washrooms. <laughs> uh, and then 2.30, we'll do uh, the panel discussion and we'll invite uh, some of the key people that were present in each of the thematic discussion and we'll invite them to give their opinions on the priorities that are emerging to, uh, um, and, and also maybe to give a bit more uh, recommendation on what could we do on the shorter term and what do we need to do in order to be also strategic on a longer term? Uh, so that's going to be happening um, uh, with the panel discussion, which hopefully will trigger a lot of comments uh, either on the chat box or eventually uh, asking you to intervene directly uh, during the, uh, the, the panel discussion and ask some question and participate in the exchanges. And then we'll finish the day with a conclusion by myself and by uh, Cathy Barswick who's the president of the uh, Institute. So with that being said, I will leave the floor for the next, for the first block of the day to Dale uh, uh, Brigin. And so, so, and so I'll leave the, the floor to Dale and uh, Louis is gonna be the, uh, the moderator for this initial session. Merci, Alain. And I'm Dale Bugin. I'm the VP of Research at the Institute. I'll note I'm on traditional Algonquin territory in Ottawa. Uh, just a quick note to kick things off, I think, from the Institute's perspective. The Institute and our philanthropic partners commissioned uh, the Institute Energy de Troche and Oranos to independently design and host this workshop and all the, 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 the led up to this forum and the forum itself in order to help us us get perspectives beyond the expert panels that work with the Institute and beyond our own little bubbles of information. So just wanted to thank Alain and Norman and Louis for managing and overseeing these online sessions over the last two weeks. For Institute staff, so far our role has been a passive one. We've been listening carefully over the last two weeks. Uh, so today I want to give kind of the floor to three parts of my team, uh, Anna Canduth, Dylan Clark, and Jason Dion. We're all rapporteurs in the earlier sessions and are gonna be reporting back and basically summarizing what they heard. They aren't gonna to try to interpret what they heard, but instead summarize the main points and kind of distill the essence that, that came out of those earlier sessions. So I just wanted to set that up uh, and I will pass it back to Louis for moderation. Thanks, uh, Dale. Yeah, th thank you, Dale, and thanks for, uh, uh, for this introduction. I would also like to add to the list of those three people that were, uh, to, that the three reporters that you named, uh, the other one that participated uh, through those various sessions. They are uh, Wasim uh, Ahmed, Jonathan Arnold, Jeremy Morehouse, Ryan Ness, all from the uh, Climate, uh, Climate uh, Choice Institute, and uh, Florian Pedroli, who works with us at the uh, Institut d'Energie Trottier. I'd like to thank them all. And you said they had a passive role, but uh, I think it was quite active to them just, just listening and taking uh, great notes. So I thank them all. Uh, I would just like also to add a few notes before I, I pass the, uh, uh, before we start with the first uh, team synthesis, uh, the fact that uh, one more comment on the teams that were selected. We purposely designed those teams not to, to be um, uh, across the, the silos. So instead of replicating like one team on adaptation, one team on mitigation, and one on, uh, on uh, clean growth, we purposely designed them so that we could uh, foster uh, discussions through uh, various expertise. Uh, so without further ado, I would like, I would invite uh, um, Anna to, uh, say, uh, to make the, the, the synthesis of the first uh, workshop, uh, first uh, team session, sorry. 
Sure, and I'll invite Jason to share his screen. I believe he's going to be flipping through. Oh, there he goes. All righty. Donc, bonjour à toutes et à tous. Je m'appelle Anna Kendrick et je suis associée de recherche à l'Institut canadien pour les choix climatiques. And as Louis and Dale said, over the past few weeks, I've been listening in on the discussions surrounding theme one, cohabitation and governance, a need for new policy approaches. But before I begin my short summary, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that I live and work on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat. And this territory continues to be home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. Starting this conversation with a recognition of and respect for Indigenous peoples is critically important, especially when we have conversations about governance, as Indigenous peoples continue to be underrepresented at decision-making tables and in policy development processes, and also continue to be denied their inherent right to self-determination. So with that, over the next few minutes, I'll provide a brief overview of the key issues facing climate policy governance that were identified during the breakout discussions, the key research questions posed, broken out into four main themes, including some targeted research questions within that broader natural resource sector theme. So you can flip to that next slide, Jason. So over the course of the breakout sessions, a number of key challenges facing climate policy governance were discussed. First, a recognition that climate change is an urgent issue, raising some questions around whether we have time to completely rework our governance structures and get things right when action is needed now. Uh, there's this notion of moving at the speed of trust or moving at the speed of crisis. Second, that it's also a long-term issue, so durability and resilience to changing governments will be key. Uh, and among the discussions, there was a recognition that the political landscape in Canada and its increasing polarization also presents challenges to the durability of governance structures and processes. Third, and relatedly, federalism can present challenges for policy coordination since various orders of government in Canada have different jurisdiction over different aspects of climate change. Uh, fourth, that climate change is a cross-cutting issue requiring coordination and collaboration across many disciplines. So there was a lot of talk about how climate change isn't just an environmental issue, it cuts across many different policy areas and as a result, government departments. And this poses big challenges to governments and requires significant collaboration and coordination within them. Fifth, there was also a recognition that historically governance processes have excluded certain groups, notably indigenous governments and communities, sometimes municipalities as well as youth. So how can we ensure that governance processes are inclusive and equitable, recognizing that representation matters and is vital to developing equitable and inclusive policies and programs? But at the same time, there was also a recognition that the question should not be limited to how Indigenous peoples are going to participate in projects led by federal, provincial, and territorial governments, rather how they are rights-bearing nations that need to be recognized as such. So some pointed to the need for a fundamental rethink about how decisions are made and how governments can fulfill the rights and principles specified in UNDRIP and by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And finally, there is a recognition that integration across adaptation, mitigation, and clean growth is hard. Uh, the impacts, approaches, and policy challenges are different across all three. So how can we create coordinated governance processes that address all three simultaneously? And next slide, Jason. So four key themes that, em that emerged during the theme one breakout sessions, and thanks to our chair, Kathy Newhook, uh, for largely conceptualizing these themes, uh, were one, top-down governance, bottom-up government governance, and everything in between, so referring to that intergovernmental collaboration and cooperation. Two, institutional innovation and institutions that spur innovation. Three, the need for more knowledge mobilization. And then four, situating the governance conversation within the context of the natural resources sector. So first, top-down governance. There were a number of conversations that focused on the role of the federal government and how governance processes at the federal level can drive policy change and improve outcomes. Some asked whether more centralization is the answer, and if so, what federally-led agreements have worked and why. There are also a lot of discussions around what changes could be made at the federal level to improve cohabitation within government. 
recognizing that policy is not just an environmental issue again, but cuts, cuts across many different government departments. And some specific questions that emerged within that conversation were, what role does the naming and placement of climate change within government departments have on cross-cutting or cross-collaboration? What are the role of mandate letters in encouraging that collaboration? And then what examples exist in Canada and abroad of that collaboration? So looking at the UK Cabinet Committee on Climate Change or the federal government's Clean Growth Hub here in Canada. And with respect to bottom-up governance, there were questions around the role of community engagement in policy development. So what are some effective models of community or citizen-led policy development? And the idea of citizen assemblies were raised a number of times as a potential governance approach to increase that community level engagement and policy development. And there were also a number of examples shared of Indigenous communities who are leading the charge on climate change action at the local level, raising questions of how governments can better support that local leadership and build capacity at the local level to continue this progress. And there are also questions about what other folks need to be involved in these processes for climate action to be successful from industry to academics and thought leaders. And finally, multi-level cooperation and coordination so that everything in between. What are the best mechanisms for multi-governmental collaboration? What are the successful models for addressing complex cross-cutting issues, especially related to better inclusion of municipal and indigenous governments in policy and decision-making? There was also a recognition that the, for the need for governance processes to recognize and support government to government relationships with indigenous governments. Another key question raised was around how, whether it's better to encourage uh, policy harmonization or decentralize responsibility, but have overarching goals and missions. So in particular, there was significant discussion around this idea of policy harmonization, highlighting the need to understand the intersection of climate policies at various orders of government, how do they interact? What are the opportunities for policy coherence? How can we show whether there are existing tensions between overlapping policies and what the impact of that overlap is? Perhaps there are some potential research questions around highlighting the costs and benefits of policy harmonization as a way to nudge governments towards better coordination and cooperation. But at the same time, there is also a recognition that policy harmonization may not always be the right approach. So there's a need to better understand where policy should recognize regional diversity, for example. And finally, there are several questions around what incentives exist to encourage cooperation between different orders of government. Uh, what conditions can facilitate intergovernmental collaboration? So moving on to the next theme, uh, it was around the idea of institutional innovation and also how institutions can spur innovation. So there is this question around what kind of public service do we need for a low carbon transition, recognizing that public servants for a range of reasons can be risk averse. How can government institutions shift to an innovative culture rather than one that's risk averse, fostering innovation both inside and outside of government. And examples of innovative approaches included regulatory sandboxes, mission oriented innovation, challenge based approaches and incubator approaches. And key to this discussion was also understanding what barriers exist to innovation, both within government and outside. There are also questions of innovation within the context of how governments have governments work together. So what lessons, for example, can we learn from the cohesive or not response to COVID-19? So there was an acknowledgement that there's been a lot of institutional innovation and inter and intra governmental collaboration um, in response to the COVID-19 crisis. So what factors are transferable here, what worked and what didn't work and why? So the question of leveraging best practices came up frequently throughout every breakout session and it really cuts across the other themes mentioned here, but due to its prominence throughout, we've pulled it out as a distinct theme. So key questions included, how can we effectively mobilize and leverage the information and knowledge that already exists, with folks suggesting that in many cases we don't need to reinvent the wheel? How can we learn from existing models and best practices, both in and outside of climate policy and in and outside of Canada? So finally, the last breakout session con concluded with a discussion of research questions in the context of natural resources. And I will note that, uh, that this discussion was a bit more loosely tied to governance than the preceding themes. 
but the questions have been grouped into two broad categories, shifting jobs and resources, as well as the circular economy. So within shifting jobs and resources, first, how do we design pivot plans for small communities dependent on natural resource extraction? And within that question, what mentorship opportunities exist for youth in these communities and what opportunities exist for capacity building? What will be the role of rare earth minerals in Canada's future natural resources sector, both uh, for manufacturing and export opportunities? What will be the role of land use in the low carbon transition? What are the opportunities and also the trade-offs of using land? For example, the mitigation potential versus threats to ecosystem biodiversity and food sovereignty and security. What types of energy will we use in the future and how do we prepare our infrastructure? For example, preparing pipelines for hydrogen. And then lastly, within the context of the circular economy, what are the life cycle impacts of biomass? What are the best, most sustainable uses for it? And also this idea of exploring innovation, both uh, for policy innovation and technology innovation in waste diversion and management, recognizing that federal policy decisions will have implications for local governments, speaking again to that question of intergovernmental collaboration and governance. So that's a short summary of what I heard during the breakout section. Uh, folks in theme one, I hope I did your conversation justice. Yes, thank you, Anna. That's a great, uh, great summary. Uh, I'd like to ask one question about the, uh, uh, you briefly talked about uh, policy harmonization, saying that, uh, well, it's good in some cases and not in other. You have some, uh, some examples of harmonization that, that were discussed and discussed uh, and proven, uh, discussed in a way that uh, was shown positive, let's say, successful. Yeah, for successes, um, the BC Energy Step Code was praised as a positive example where the building code is providing opportunities for harmonization across municipalities in that province uh, and showing benefits to the building industry as well uh, that are coming with that harmonization. There was also a discussion of, uh, I believe it's called the Green Button Alliance, um, which seeks to standardize energy data and collection sharing across uh, jurisdictions, I believe. But there are also some interesting conversations about where policy harmonization uh, could benefit um, examples where things aren't working well. And I believe there was an example of uh, BC programs for low income individuals um, that at times have been conflicting with each other. And there's, uh, there was a review of those programs, I believe, that showed where there were actually unintended consequences of those policies kind of conflicting with one another and overlapping. Good. Well, yeah, thank you. That's great. Okay, so let, let, let's switch to uh, theme number two, Dylan Clark, who's a senior research associate for Climate Tracer. I will be presenting that, Dylan. Wonderful. Thank you, Louis, and, and good afternoon for everybody on the East Coast and, and good morning for all of those on the West. My name is Don Clark. As Louis said, I'm a senior research associate with the Canadian Institute for Climate Choices. I'd first like to acknowledge that I am on the traditional and unceded land of Coast Salish peoples, so Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh. As Dale said in his introduction, I'm summarizing what I heard as a reporter for theme two session on social equity dimensions of low carbon transitions and adaptation in a warming world. I do wanna also highlight that while I'm not seeking to interpret the conversations that took place, my positionality as a, a white male researcher certainly limits my ability to fully understand many of the issues that were discussed. And I hope that I'm able to respectfully give voice to the thoughts and, and ideas that were expressed during those conversations. Uh, next slide, please there, Jason. The foundation for discussions that took place during the theme two session, I think were twofold. Broadly, there was an understanding from the participants that one, there are deeply rooted issues of fairness embedded in both climate policy as well as climate change impacts. And two, that science and policy development are rarely meaningfully engaging and reflecting the lived experiences and knowledge of communities across Canada, particularly the communities most impacted. During the introduction session of theme two, Dr. Ian Morrow of the University of Winnipeg described the challenges through a mosaic of stories uh, from across Canada. 
These included stories of communities being impacted across uh, Inuit Nunungat um, from changes in hunting and ecosystems to impacts of communities with just transition across the prairies. Ian challenged participants to think about how research and policy development can be done differently to better uh, include and work towards uh, equity in both climate change policy outcomes as well as uh, rectifying uh, injustices and climate change impacts. Next slide, please, there, Jason. Three major themes uh, really emerged from the discussions that took place. And I think across these themes, uh, they can be summarized as, as issues related to knowledge, framing, and action, where equity is, is very cross-cutting and there are intersections. In terms of knowledge, there were rich discussions and reflections on how research is usually done and questions about the uh, structures and status quo of how knowledge is generated. In terms of framing, participants discussed reframing or repositioning climate change policy to better reflect the day-to-day -day concerns of people in Canada. And in terms of action, researchers uh, and participants in the discussion talked about mobilizing and empowering practitioners and communities better through work. I think, too, uh, just looking back at, at Anna's presentation, there were certainly uh, cross-cutting and, and crossover uh, between theme two points and, and some of the discussions that it sounds like happened in theme one. Next slide, please there, Jason. So focusing first on, on the knowledge component there, improving how research is conducted. Many participants articulated the importance of decolonializing research and reimagining research processes. Participants in the session articulated the importance of uh, research working with communities, not just because communities are, are impacted more, but because communities have knowledge and ideas that are valuable and need to flow into research processes. There was also an articulation uh, that um, it's important to look at two-eyed seeing um, and that there are valuable ways of incorporating both Western science and indigenous traditional knowledge into research processes. Participants in the session described and expressed that indigenous traditional knowledge should not be a supplement or a afterthought, but that it is equally valued and needs to be equally reflected in research processes and policy development. And finally, in terms of how this is implemented, there was broad discussions of the importance of interdisciplinary teams and research processes as we re-envision what research looks like. Uh, participants described the importance particularly of psychologists and behavioral scientists as we think about uh, implementation and communication of research outcomes and policies. There were also discussions of the importance of social scientists and uh, researchers that are deeply embedded in community and can conduct community-based research. Some participants also expressed that not all researchers need to be or are capable and well-suited to be working with communities and that through collaboration and trust across broad interdisciplinary research teams, some of those gaps can be bridged. Next slide there, Jason. The second theme was around, as I said, framing. And so a lot of discussions around framing climate change as a well-being and health issue and seeding climate change issues in experiences and concerns of communities. So participants suggested that currently there's silos between the research communities and policy development and the day-to-day -day experiences of communities and that science and policymakers uh, could work to better connect and design uh, policies by working with and collaborating closer with communities. Participants suggested that focusing on issues that are compelling to people such as health, food security, housing, and interconnecting climate change policies to those issues in a broader framing may be advantageous both in terms of uptake of policy as well as uptake of research and delivery of research. Uh, some of the participants described that the siloing of mitigation, adaptation, and clean growth, for example, doesn't necessarily translate into lived experiences and day-to-day -day realities of many people living across the country. Participants also dis 
describe the importance in thinking of social equity uh, topics in theme two of looking at and measuring outcomes from climate policy through a lens of what does it do to social justice implications and equity and looking at climate change impacts through that lens as well. Uh, next slide there, Jason. Finally, action. Action was the final kind of theme that came out of discussions and looking at how researchers and policymakers can support practitioners and communities better. Circling back, I think, to the root causes of, of social equity problems, participants noted that it's important to, and that there is a disconnect often between policymakers and the communities uh, that they're working to alleviate or address the concerns of. And that it's important that communities are resourced uh, to be able to work better uh, with researchers and that researchers are working with uh, communities in tandem. Uh, there was broad discussion in the group about um, how we can redesign research in a way that is testing out new ideas. Some participants described practices similar to kind of agricultural extension models or health communities randomized control uh, trials where ideas and new solutions are being implemented and worked through with community in order to compare and develop uh, ideas moving forward. It was also widely articulated that there is a lot of information out there that can be synthesized and that literature reviews or systematic literature reviews could collate a lot of the community knowledge and work that has been done in community at a higher level to compile nested stories from across the country into broader narratives and uh, in inform policy that way. Finally, there were broad discussions about different ways to communicate findings and information, such as storytelling, uh, relying on broader medium, such as film and photography, and working with communities and participatory mapping. Next slide there, Jason. Thanks. So finally, in the context of natural resources and the discussions that we're talking about today at the forum, participants articulated four key points that we heard. One, that natural resources should be defined broadly. So it was expressed that natural resources for many communities across Canada doesn't just include the traditional kind of extraction resources of oil, gas, and minerals, but also includes uh, ecosystems and animals and plants like caribou, cedar trees, and sea ice. Participants also articulated that natural resources are very interconnected with health and land and can't be thought of through silos or independent systems. It was also expressed that some indigenous knowledge systems, for example, uh, the inherent, uh, there's inherent value and importance in sustainably harvesting uh, what you can use and not anymore, and that using everything of what is harvested and uh, used from the land is important. Participants also uh, described the importance and respect of harvesting what is presented to you through some indigenous knowledge systems as well. And that relates back to broader systems and thinking around what natural resources are. It was also articulated that historically marginalized and disenfranchised groups should be meaningfully involved in the development of research questions and policies, particularly around natural resources. Many participants noted that there was a largely, that the theme two group was largely a group of white settlers and that there was little representation from black, indigenous and peoples of color. And that that has implications for the research questions that are maybe being thought of and discussed. And finally, uh, it was articulated that it's important that researchers start by listening and that it's important to listen to communities and those on the ground that are experiencing the impacts or maybe it would experience policies firsthand. So with that, I'll pass it over uh, back to Lili uh, and, and Jason. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Dylan. Uh, uh, speaking of natural resources, well, many people are saying that, well, there's a big iniquity uh, in the fact that the uh, between the contribution one makes to global, uh, climate changes and the, the consequences uh, of, of those uh, uh, climate changes. Uh, 
where there's some discussion about the fact that, well, in the natural resources transformation that will need to occur, can could that be used, the opportunities that are there, could that be used to try to reduce this inequity in, in yeah, reduce the inequity between what we contribute and the impact we're suffering? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I, I think the discussions were generally at a higher level where there were articulations that those decisions need to be made and in, in thoughtfully incorporating communities and, and individuals that maybe would be impacted to ensure that they are able to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, thanks. Okay, third theme uh, that would be uh, presented by Jason Dion, who's the uh, Mitigation Research Director at uh, the Canadian Institute of Climate uh, Choices. Jason? Thank you, Louis. Uh, so yeah, so as Louis mentioned, I'm the Mitigation Research Director at the Institute, uh, and I'll start by acknowledging that I'm on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin. I'll be giving a, a bit of an overview of the discussions around theme three, which was titled Integrative Strategies, Realizing Transformations Through the Successful Implementation of Climate Policy. And I'll start by mapping out some of the issues and challenges that were raised in these discussions. And, and the first one of those was around this idea of incremental versus disruptive change. And you know, this idea that transformation is what's required, that small fixes aren't enough, and that we need systems change but that aggressive change also risks a counter reaction that can lead to backsliding and that what this leads to is perhaps the need to work at different time scales at the same time squaring on the one hand the perhaps the necessity of more incremental near-term action with this at the same time the more fundamental transformation required in the long term so a bit of a difficult balancing act there Another theme was around the idea of technical versus social innovation. And it's often easier to invest in technical innovation than it is in social innovation, but that societal transformation, and, and for example, a, a big example being changing humans' relationship with nature might also prove critical in these larger transitions and transformations. But the key question being how to drive social innovation at scale in time, given the urgency of many, many of these issues. And then a related question of how to harness the energy that exists in, in youth-led movements on climate change. So some big questions there on the social front. Some other issues and challenges related to thinking about financial, technological, and the behavioral dimensions of this transformation, which were explicitly part of the scope of this theme, thinking about these dimensions in an integrated way requires acknowledging how power structures play a role. So there are powerful institutions that will work against particular changes. One participant noted that there might need to be a clear-eyed view of the way in which the fossil fuel sector, for example, engages on climate policy. It also requires grappling with complexity. So when you're thinking about these financial, technological, behavioral dimensions, you're, you're talking about a lot of players by definition, but also just the, the nature of the modern world and how diffuse power is and the amount of actors involved, just a really, really complex array of, of actors that needs to be in, involved in these greater transitions and transformations. So a very complex landscape to engage in. There's also the need that transformation cannot and must not look the same everywhere. So the need to develop tailored solutions makes it even more complex. And also to concurrently think about other environmental challenges. So thinking beyond climate to how are we going to weigh impacts on biodiversity, air pollution, water quality, to take a few examples. Some other issues and challenges that came up uh, were around the idea that meaningful change is going to require integrated approaches. So not only on those technological, behavioral, financial dimensions I was talking about in the last slide, but also in terms of the tools that get brought to bear. So regulation, incentives, training, international cooperation, really bringing these to, get, bringing these to bear in an integrated and, and cohesive way. And that this might not often come naturally to governments because it requires breaking down silos. So that, that's a key thing to consider in these larger transitions. Uh, the fact that meaningful change is going to require greater policy certainty and consistency also came up in the discussions. That you know, this, this, this idea of the, the need for a stable, predictable policy landscape to drive the needed change in investment is, is something that there's just been a perennial challenge in terms of uh, dealing with climate change. Uh, and the idea also came up the, of the need to address the protect reactions that exist on the part of industry in some cases that can act as barriers to policy change. And in terms of that front of policy consistency, there was some discussion around the need for consistency across governments uh, and the need to achieve better harm, the fact that the need to achieve better harmonization would need to be reconciled with this idea that you don't wanna close off space for governments to develop tailored solutions. So again, another tricky balancing act there. 
There was also the idea of consistency within governments being a challenge, that the need to better align policy and object policy and objectives across government departments and agencies can be a bit of a challenge, that they're not always thinking uh, and, and speaking of one, with one mind. In terms of other issues and challenges, one, one theme that came up that a few participants underscore is the idea that Canada is ready for a grown-up conversation around these issues. That part of that is that we need to establish a social consensus that there is a problem and we need to act, but that that's not also enough and that, that perhaps the problem is that that's too narrow of a frame. And there was this idea that the Canadian mindset is ripe for a conversation about what do we want to be when we grow up, as, as one participant put it. Do we want to be champions, leaders, and innovators? And, and in what? And, and how does climate change integrate with that? And the, the, big, under, the big kind of under, un, overarching idea here being we need to be more intentional about what we want to achieve. But the context also matters in this conversation. So considerations of equity and fairness need to be central in, the, in as many of the ways Dylan was talking about. And also that we need to reflect Canadian complexity that you know, we are doing policy making within a federation which comes with a lot of unique challenges and, and considerations. There's different politics when it comes to these issues across the country. Uh, and there's different sector level challenges and opportunities. So this is just a sort of sample of, of many of the issues and challenges that came up but, but hopefully it provides a, a, a decent overview. So let's now shift to some of the research, prior, excuse me, research ideas that came up in these conversations. Uh, so I've taken the liberty of grouping them under five themes, uh, and those are me measurement and indicators, setting and acting on priorities, how to drive behavioral change, financial instruments and innovations, and transformation pathways for Canada's natural resource sectors. So I'll, I'll talk about each of these in turn. So first, in, in measurement and indicators, there was this idea of some research around consumption-based GHG accounts for Canada. So our, our GHG and every country's GHG inventory system focuses on territorial emissions. So there was this idea, and other countries are doing this, of what about a complementary system of accounts that considers the global footprint of the products that we consume and the services we consume in Canada. And that not considering this could cause you to overlook the GHG emissions you're effectively outsourcing to others. So this was identified as, as one potential priority research area. Another was indicators for adaptation. Uh, so in this area, the, the lack of data is a big enough problem in adaptation, but that we also lack consensus on what we need to measure, where our priorities are, and what targets for the, for the future should be. So this was seen as an area sort of ripe for research and, and a closer look. Another idea was looking at data barriers to measuring progress, so addressing data gaps uh, and issues in what gets counted and how. And finally, there was an idea of an integrated geographic information system that would act as a resource to, to folks of all stripes, showing you know, things like health impacts from GHG emissions, specific climate risks that exist in different parts of the country, but also overlaying this with demographic and socioeconomic lenses so people could really understand the different challenges and opportunities that exist in different parts of the country in a, in a really rich way. So creating that sort of a resource uh, for folks in the research community, policymakers, et cetera. So another one of these, these buckets of, of potential research areas was setting and acting on priorities. And this could kind of be broken down into two areas. So first was the priorities we need to act on now. And so there was this idea of starting with a sectoral mapping where we would identify priorities uh, and do a deep dive on the behavioral, technological, financial barriers that might exist to their, their uptake and how to overcome them. There was also this idea, and this was you know, potentially a complement or potentially a different way of taking on this same challenge, and that's to take a systems level approach. So for example, as per, asking questions like, what change do we wanna drive in the natural gas energy ecosystem, for example, and how? So you know, separate from this idea of, of what we need to be doing now, there was also this discussion of, of research around winning the long game through innovation. Uh, and that was, uh, one of the participants brought up this idea of developing a framework for assessing climate policies based on their ability to drive meaningful reductions or meaningful adaptation, both at home and abroad. So sort of doing a triage in terms of priorities to look at what we could leverage through our own efforts to make a big difference uh, globally. But then adding another step in that triage to look for co-benefits. So how could Canada, for example, create an industrial cluster around one of these areas that aligns with specific capacities or resources that exist in the country? And then going even a step beyond that, and Anna talked about some of these, so speaking to the how to go about this. So whether it's regulatory sandboxes, mission-driven innovation, taking a portfolio approach. So kind of two big themes in, within this bucket of, of setting and acting on priorities, kind of distinguishing what we need to be doing in the nearer term versus the long, you know, aiming at the longer term. Another area was this, this idea of how to drive behavioral change. Uh, and so the research idea here was, 
to identify some of the behavioral nudges that might need to happen and how big they would have to be in a given area to unleash a given solution or, or remove barriers to its uptake. And in the mitigation space, there was discussion of the, the need to recognize that making people feel guilty and responsible doesn't really inspire action and that there's a need to incentivize people to get involved, perhaps connecting it to what it might mean for them in a more practical day-to-day -day sense. And in the adaptation front, the idea that information is power, that, that understanding the climate risks that exist for, for an individual, for a, a sector, a company, and the potential interventions that are available is, is really can empower and uh, enable action. There was also this sort of undercutting idea that in taking on any of these topics, it's absolutely essential to have a realistic picture of behavioral change and technology adoption. Uh, so in including the role of early versus late adopters, you know, risk perception and tolerance. And the idea came up that experiments can in fact help reveal real world behaviors and critically what works in terms of driving behavioral change. So the next area was around financial instruments and innovation. So a, a few things came up here. One was this idea of realizing tax code changes for encouraging private sector investment in clean innovation. So things like uh, capital cost allowances, tax credits, flow through shares. Uh, some participants noted that Smart Prosperity had done some work in this space. And the idea was to sort of continue to carry that torch and look at what would be ways to actually get these, these sorts of changes realized in the tax code. There was also the idea of mortgage approvals that consider the full costs of home ownership. For example, considering the impact of lower operating costs due to greater energy efficiency or the potential effect of, of climate risks. Additionally, this idea came up of the public sector as a green loan underwriter, where the federal government could use its borrowing power to make green loans more accessible, acting as an underwriter like it does with the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. So a few ideas there in the financial space. And then finally, there was this area of transformation pathways for Canada's natural resource sectors. And Anna and Dylan, I think, both noted that, you know, natural resources is a big category. Uh, so, I, you know, but nevertheless, in our discussions, at least, the, the focus did tend to skew towards the fossil fuels role in this natural resource conversation. Uh, and so one research idea came up around how to transform the current fossil fuel sector into a clean hydrocarbon sector, uh, potentially identifying pathways for natural resources to be not only uh, a source of emissions, but becoming part of a solution. Uh, and, you know, conversations like this are already ongoing around, could we use fossil fuels other ways than burning them? So, you know, carbon fiber in vehicles, sequestering carbon in concrete. Uh, but of course, costs are a barrier in these solutions. So some of the research could focus on, on lowering those barriers. There was also the idea within this about how to support those subsectors that have high capital expenditures, thin margins, and high emissions that might not be in a position to easily undertake this sort of transition or transformation. And related to this, I mean, the idea being here that the, this research would be aimed to provide clarity around challenges, barriers, and investment needs, but also the alternatives to this kind of transformation, that, that to really kind of provide a, a fully scoped view of, of what this would involve, what the different alternatives are so that a sort of you know, cost benefit analysis could be undertaken of, of what's the right sort of approach uh, to transformation in these natural resource sectors and, and particularly fossil fuels. Uh, so that concludes the slides I had. So I'll pull them down now and uh, thank you. Thanks, thanks Jason. That's uh... Quite, uh, quite a nice summary. Uh, we see that there's many, many things to still to discuss and uh, a lot of research questions to address. Um, I would like to talk about, uh, uh, first I was, I wasn't, it was interesting to see that we talked as much uh, about uh, uh, adaptation than about, than we talked about mitigation in that theme, even though one could have thought that it was all about mitigation. No, but it was many things about uh, adaptation. Uh, what about, and there was some discussion about uh, ad indicators for adaptation and, and, and could you talk a bit more about that if there was something and also about the um, behavioral change, not only linked with uh, mitigation, but also adap with adaptation. How, how could we influence behavioral changes in that? Yeah, so, so adaptation did come up quite prominently in the discussions and I hope that came through in the presentation deck. And around this idea of, of indicators for adaptation, uh, some of the participants noted that ECCC set up an advisory panel to consider how to track progress in adaptation and resilience, but that this sort of thing is inherently tricky because it touches on so many issues and it's, it's difficult to reduce it to one metric. You know, the, in mitigation, it's, it's emissions of CO2 equivalent, but there's not really any equivalent uh, in the adaptation space. And participants noted it's a reason why we haven't seen a clear vision for what a resilient or adapted Canada looks like. 
So the idea is that the starting point for this sort of research would be to reflect on the goal or goals that, that Canada should have, and from there to identify the indicators that can be tracked. So the Institute has done some work on, on clean growth indicators and recognizes there's lots of work to do on the adaptation front here. So, so lots to unpack potentially in this area. Good, thanks. Well, uh, thank you. I would like to thank the three of you. That was, that was a nice summaries. Uh, many, many food for thought and many things to, uh, to still address. And, and I would conclude by saying that I, I'm, I was, I'm happy to see that many uh, discussions items were, were, are common through the, uh, the three themes. So it shows that, yes, there is a need for, for having this, uh, this across silos uh, conversation. Thank you. Alain, I will pass the baton back to you. Thanks, Louis. Uh, and what I'd like to add also is to say that uh, I think we've already made a long way in the, in during this event because I remember the initial discussion on September 14, 15, and 16, and it was clearly all over the map. You know, there were all kinds of issues identified, etc. And now looking at the slides, uh, there's still a lot of information, but it's very much more structured. And I think it's already quite useful uh, to look at. So, so that's why I want to ask people participating right now to think about what's missing. Is there an obvious gaps uh, that, are, that have not bit, been identified? Uh, and also to maybe start to think about what would you think is uh, key priorities, key issues that have been identified so far. And just to get uh, you going for the panel discussion that is gonna happen after this uh, plenary presentation, 